Hello, hello, are we getting any audio out? Let's see. James, hello, can you hear me? I can. Great, then I'm pretty sure that means the live stream can as well. Awesome. Okay, we're gonna get this party started, I think. Let me just make sure I'm, oh, great. Thanks, Lai. Thanks for letting me know that you can hear me. Okay. Hello. Uh, I was born in Oak Harbor Naval Base and raised in San Diego, and I uh, finished high school in Colorado. I'm an illustrator, and I dabble in multiple mediums, and uh, 
I try to experience a lot of what art has to offer me that exists within both my imagination and reality. And so with this show, we're dealing with escapism, as you can read in my artist statement. Um, to briefly paraphrase what I do is I take a lot of inspiration from the world and, and issues that are around James, me. James, I'm gonna interrupt you for one second, so sorry. We were really delayed on the beginning, so it's just now picking up. Would you mind starting um, your talk from the beginning? Hey, one second. Can you still yeah. see my screen? Okay. Yeah, we're, we're back on. Everyone's letting me know we're back on. We dropped out there for a minute. So thank you everyone for being patient with us. We really appreciate it. Okay. Again, welcome to my show, which is Metaphysically Wrinkle Free. Uh, my art is about getting to the heart of a lot of uh, social issues and subject, but very much defined in my own way. Uh, to start, let me go ahead and tell you uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born on Oak Harbor Naval Base in Washington. I was raised in San Diego uh, until I finished high school in Colorado. I'm an illustrator and I dabble in a lot of multimedia, video and uh, computer graphics and illustration. And for this show, I decided to specifically do drawings and paintings because it was a, a great way that I found to express myself in some of the studies and some of the practices that I've experienced here at SNU. Uh, with my show, I'm addressing uh, escapism and a lot of the things that we do to escape our daily life and a lot of the things we do to escape some of the thoughts that are so pressing in social issues. Um, I draw really heavily on a lot of the inspiration that I find in cartoons, TV, digital media. I grew up writing and doing graffiti on my best time in my life, but I still did it. Um, and I've hopefully come together to find a rhythm of my own when it comes to some of these subjects. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is some of these influences. One of the big influences that I have is uh, Da Vinci's anatomy sketchbooks. When I was a medic in the military, um, I studied these a lot. And the pathways and tubing that I found in these drawings led me to understand a lot about anatomy and the fact that we are all made up of tubes. Tubes bring us life, channels, things go through it, things come to you. It's a transitory conduit, literally. Um, and so this was a huge influence on me. Another big influence lately has been graphic design and digital illustration. And one of my favorites, and anybody that's ever been to one of my talks knows that I love this guy. This is Tiago Hoysel. He's a Brazilian character artist, and he does digital work that's lighthearted but addresses social issues. Um, another person growing up that was huge for me was Bill Watterson. Uh, I read a ton of Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, I love his perspective, and he is the ultimate escapist. Um, he had a friend named after a philosopher that they ran around having adventures. I can't think of anything funner and a childhood to be. Um, addressing issues and the things around us and the style in which we do it is very important to me. And I mentioned I'm into graffiti and the stencil graffiti that conceptual artist Banksy puts forth is very influential in a lot of things I do, if not the style that he has, but more the conceptual attitude and approach that he has. Um, and it's also a little rad that we don't know who the dude is. Uh, another big person growing up was Twist, uh, AKA Barry McGee, another guy that just did his own thing. And the drawings were formal, but they were distorted. It was surreal. And, and that was a huge influence along with a lot of Dolly and uh, a lot of other things. The first uh, drawing I'd like to look at tonight is called Morphine Disconnected. And uh, this represents a lot of things. Uh, for me, it's, I have nerve damage in my face. 
And before I decided to go back to school, they had me on a lot of drugs to try and control that pain that I don't um, normally take. And so that situation led me to express this sort of disconnected, convoluted idea. Uh, one of the big things that I like to think about is that with being a medic in medical technology, we have a lot of things that assist us like cochlear e implants, um, voice box implants, our concept of time, all these things are advanced and, and understood through science. Um, the helix of DNA and the chemicals that we put into ourselves to deal with life, deal with pain and escape the things uh, that drive us daily. Um, one of the fun things I had, or fun experiences, excuse me, that I had when I was doing this was understanding the shape, the hatching, and getting back to a fundamental drawing, uh, which is something I very much love, very much connect with. And so we see a lot of these things interpreted interpreted in a surreal graffiti or distorted type of manner. And this is on a map board with colored pencils and pastels. Uh, and it's something that really encapsulates a lot of the convoluted attitude that so some of these drugs involve and their ability to help us escape, but stay entwined with the problems that exist. The next piece of art that I'd like to show you and talk about is called sans inertia, which basically means uh, no movement without movement. And um, as an escapist, because I am a digital artist and I do enjoy the solace of drawing, we have a fascination in this country with screens. And the funny thing about that fascination is that we spend a lot of time understanding, including what we're doing right now, something that's objectified on the screen, something that's put into a role, the artist, the hero, uh, a lot of other things that are encapsulated in that understanding. Um, when I drew this, that was really on my mind. And I also couldn't help myself but put a little TV artist joke in here by using the three primary ad additive colors. And then the echo of the 3D and depth was in white, which proportionately put together is the absence of color or representative of purity. And it's that understanding that I approach this with. Um, we see our fellow here who's incapacitated and doesn't have a choice in what they're doing anymore, which represents our screen addiction in the uh, United States and worldwide at this point. Um, really had a lot of fun doing this painting. It's something that has a lot of texture and i hope that if you get the chance um you could see some of that in the zoom because there is at least a quarter inch rise across this painting that i really enjoy that has some texture that gives it a lot of depth um the next painting that we're going to look at is called dilapidated and the great story about this is this is a recycled canvas that I got from my box, shout out to Jen. And it was a flat clay red painting. And I took it to do experiments on it with some of the materials I was working on. And it had this great development where the painting started to come to life in the background and the texture because the acrylic peels off the clay and so the method started to influence the painting itself. The method being that on top of earth, all this plastic that's peeling away, and this happens to be transitional art. Most art that I make is archival. This won't last. Um, 
and there's a cleansing that needs to be done. So uh, the two lobes that you just saw, those were in representation of kidneys. And this is how we're changing our DNA to spark a change in our lives because of the chemicals and the things that we put into the earth. Um, one of the big statements that I hear a lot is the environment's in trouble. And as escapists, we want to label it as something different. It's something that we don't have to pay attention to. The problem is, is that we really need to start understanding that we need to address it as our environment. And this globe is going to keep spinning long after it's non-habitable for us. So if we want to exist in this place, we have to start to understand and respect it in completely different ways. Um, I'm really happy with the way this piece turned out because of the texture and the way that it's going to develop in the future. I'm, I'm really anxious to see where it's going to be in six months um, to see how it lasts. Uh, I, and I really enjoyed uh, the way that this came together more automatically for me as a process because of the way that it developed after I picked it up and took it and started to let it have a life of its own. The next painting that we're gonna look at uh, is called Circulated Anomaly. And it's representation of a closed system. It's a little sappy romantic, but Romantics are the classic escapist. We're um, ideally always looking towards the future. A romantic is not just somebody who likes those sappy love songs, but somebody who's romantic about the idea of society. And in this, it's a closed system that represents a pressure that we can't sustain because we're not able to coexist as an open society. And this closed system just doesn't have the density within it to sustain. There's nothing there. You can't hold on to that kind of concept of hate and separation and isolation without an explosion or something that's going to affect society in a negative way. Hate, misunderstanding. Um, so as romantics, we understand that this model is actually really a heart and we'll see it as a heart i saw it as one of da vinci's sketches that i showed you earlier with the tubes and the veins and the capillaries being able to represent the coming and going of things and bringing life to a sack of tubes the heart is an amazing muscle and our understanding of it is as an apparatus but it's so much more. It's why we say things affect us in the heart, things uh, affect us in the soul, and we point to our chest. It's gestural, and it's programmed into our primitive nature from the time before time before time. Uh, I had a lot of uh, interesting shading that I, I really got to play with in this, and the painting itself was just a fun technical drawing for me. Um, but it ended up being so much more as it started to encompass a theme and an understanding of the concept that I started with, but is totally different from the sketch that I started with. The next painting I want to talk about is called Obstacles. Now, there's another organism that exists as tubes. And we classically dismiss it as a non-sentient being. And we find out more and more through science that trees, plants, have nerves, scream, have feelings, reactions. And as escapists, we just say, ah, it'll grow back. And the chemistry and the, and the things that we put into that environment and deforestation is a lot of what inspired this painting and the concept behind it. Um, 
the geometric forms in the background are abstracted animals. Have fun trying to pick out which ones they are. And I've been getting into that a lot more lately, which is taking objects and trying to see their true form to push forward with the way that they're depicted and how we depersonalize those kind of animals in this environment. And it really shows me the persistence of plants to be able to be flexible and grow through and permeate those permanent substances that we have put in this world, whether it be chemical fire or a physical object like a pipe. Um, the other thing that I, I really had fun with is I limited myself to three colors, but I was allowed to blend them. And there's brushwork and uh, pen work in this one that I really, really enjoy because of the free flowing nature of it. The next slide that I wanna talk about is really personal for me. Um, when I was a kid, I had eye surgery and funnily enough that became my first memory i remember walking into the naval hospital holding my dad's hand i remember the orderly and i was 18 months old it was the first time my brain chemistry kicked on now the spooky bit about this is that when i had bandages on my eyes my eyes would tear up and it would leak red fluid and it looked like I had blood running out of my eyes and I would get up in the middle of the night and try and negotiate things. And my imagination would take over. The truly personal bit about this is that while I started to do this painting for myself, uh, it really started to encompass a lot of the feelings that we're having with the situation that my nephew is in right now. My sweet nephew, Jaden, was born with PVD and a paroxysmal disorder and limited sight, very limited hearing. And I've always been amazed at how he negotiates this world with nothing but love despite these disabilities. And we had a time lately that was very grim personally for our family. And while he's still with us, his movement's limited. And the poor guy just is always in my thoughts. So while this painting was started for me, it really is for my nephew, Jaden. And I just want to say we love you, guy, and we're going to see you soon. Um, I'm glad that you're home and I hope that everything's okay, but otherwise that's a lot of the reason there's more pipes in this one than some of them, because the anxiety and the expression comes out in the actual drawings and the actual fluidity and the complexity of the backgrounds and the nature of the way they're shaded. Um, what colors I use, whether I layer them with one thing or another. And that is a huge part of what I do is my art influences my emotion in ways I've never experienced before. And sometimes you have to follow those channels to create things that you enjoy. And this is really something that I enjoy. This was a painting that helped me with the time that we were going through as a family. The next slide I wanna show you is a big thing for me because it represents my love of music. Um, this is called Circadian Backbeat. And what was really going on with this one is I was listening to a lot of music and trying to find a rhythm with what I was painting. And I found that in a lot of the descendants, bad religion, old skate punk, all the way through to 
Jacob Banks and some Amos Lee and, and a lot of varieties of music. And so what this painting represents is that moment when something grabs you, when something looks, makes you turn your head and say, wait, hold on, turn that up, rewind that. And music and, and art, I, I mean, music is art, but it influences so many people in so many ways. And so I decided on this one that I needed to fill up these letters with hollow music. And so my hope was, is that if we were to do a physical show, that I was going to have some music playing with this one. And when we show next fall, I completely intend to have that up there because it really helps make this. A lot of the connections are influenced by connections I've seen as a PA, connections I've seen as a media artist, connections I've seen on music equipment, and it personifies that rhythm and motion that I feel when I paint that gets me to the end of a concept where the sketch never matches the painting, but I'm so much happier with what came out than what I originally put on paper. This, of all the paintings, I would say is a great example of my process. How I approach things in a painting is I start with a background, something that I would enjoy on itself as a painting alone. And I scribble on it, literally, like a child. I love it. I take a pencil, I go nuts. And I make these forms, and these fluid forms influence the painting from that point forward. And that is the only rule that I adhere to Moving forward, everything else is created in the moment. It's fluid within the concept. And that line structure is exactly how I get from the original blank canvas to exactly what you're seeing in my show today. Here's me. Um, first thing I'd like to say is that I'm a technician at SNU. I love that place. The attitude, the professors, the people. I've never felt it a place where it's just so much at home. And it's, it's a petri dish, as Rick says, of inspirational ideas. We bounce ideas off of each other. The class structure allows for that. And my work is a big part of that. Most people that know me know I'm a technical drawer. I'm a, I'm a drafts person. I, I, I love to sit and doodle. I doodle on everything. But that's my escape. That's how I get through my day. And a lot of these things represent things that help other people get through their day. And I'm hoping that comes through in the paintings. And I'm really glad that everybody tuned in. Um, uh, the other thing that I would say is that we got to remember that only our imagination restricts our perception. And so moving forward, don't limit your view, widen it, experience things. That's my BFA because that's what I created in an environment that is exactly that some place where you can express yourself and that is a direct representation of the attitude that I got while I was there. Um, a couple other thank yous I'd really like to just ramble off real quick is uh, thank you to Megan Ollie for putting up with my horseshit. Thank you to my mom and dad for everything that they do. Thank you to the SNU faculty. I mean, Rick, Russell, Sherry, Mary, Anna, Julia, everybody. Anza, everybody that, that worked with me there, uh, the Chesters, Robert and Jennifer, for everything they do, um, teaching, helping me sculpt and move on in, in my career is what I'm doing. Um, and my fellow students at SNU, like I said, this is a Petri dish. This is where we develop the ideas. 
And I've taken so much from that methodology and applied it in my work that it couldn't have been done at any place else like this and resulted in the stuff that I'm very happy with today. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. Um, we're going to take some questions. Also, if you have any interest in the artwork that I do, this is my website. It's got my portfolio. If nothing else, just to check it out and look at it. Um, like I said, there's a wide variety of mediums that it represents. And thank you again. Awesome. Thank you, James. You are getting a ton of love in the comment boxes, just so you know. Everyone's really into it. Our first question is from Kathy, and she asks, how long does one of these paintings, drawings take from design to completion? Honestly, there's no standard answer. It was the entire prep of the show. Uh, the other thing was circadian uh, backbeat was a week. And so it really depends on how the image develops and how everything comes out in the process. Um, I don't think any of them would take more than three months. And I say that because that's how long I had to make them. But it really varies in each of them. Great, thanks. And we do know that we're having some video glitches, but it seems like audio should still be working. Um, question from Garrett. Do you see yourself taking this work or style into the digital realm, maybe as an animation? Absolutely. Um, matter of fact, uh, I broke a couple of presentation programs trying to make it do what I wanted it to do and uh, ended up with something that I'm okay with, but I really want to take a lot further. Some of these are so complex that I could use them as backgrounds for uh, stop motion and still shots where I follow the tubes and I develop a story throughout it, or I take a new composition and do it in that manner. And that's something that I've been playing with in Premiere and we're going to work with in a class this uh, spring in the short block with Chris. So we have a question from Nikki. How did you go about the process of figuring out how to open up about personal things within your work? It's an extremely hard thing to do. Oh God, this is going to sound like a cop out, but there wasn't a choice. Um, any artist that tells you they're Personal life doesn't bleed it or isn't getting into the work. Um, and then to be argumentative, I, what's the point of being an artist if you're not going to sink yourself into it? My, my work, I think, is, if you look at my website, I have a quote on there from Picasso that says, I draw like people bite their fingernails. And that's so true. That's how I deal with my anxiety. That's how I get through situations without it i am a grumpy mad asshole just ask mega nolly i just i have to draw it's like a nervous tick and so i don't think i really had a choice that my personal life was going to come into my work my biggest issue was focus which i tend to make create words and I try to make environments. And so these are very wide scope goals. And so when I do that, I tend to try and cram too much in. So my biggest thing with this is taking one emotion and focusing on it for a week and then putting it into the painting. And so, yeah, I, I don't think I really had a choice, but I, that's kind of how it comes into the process. Great. So we have a question for Mad Dog. What's your motive after this next step? Asking you the same question. 
Um, I'm going to try and bring the images off of the canvas. I'm going to try and, how do I say this? I want an image to be able to come out of the canvas and exist in the third dimension along with environmental things that I want to add in a 4D environment. So I see it as these are sketches for the next show, which is I'm always driving to new methods. And so if I'm learning something, then I try to incorporate it into what I'm doing. So I want to make maybe like you see the drawings behind me. I want some of those tubes to actually exist in real life. Whether it's clay, paper mache, wood sculpture, or whatever, bar relief, something of that nature, that's something that I want. So we've got more questions coming at you. Here's one from AJ. Does painting help you get introspective? And how do you get over not liking what comes out if it doesn't feel right? <laughs> I don't. I. Uh, I don't know if anybody's heard me tell this story, but I have a silly little superstition that you should put half as many hours into destroying something that you did creating it if you don't like it. And so there's a method that actually. Uh, we had a life drawing teacher down at TMCC, um, Brian, that said, take an image, stand in front of the mirror, and show it to yourself. Look honestly at the expression on your face. If it's shit, get rid of it. Throw it away. And I have a belief that it's cathartic to spend a bit of time. So whether it's putting it on the floor of my studio and walking on it until everything's done, or I don't know, putting it in the fire out back, or I, I, I think it's cathartic to have some closure to those emotions and not keep uh, those things bottled up when it comes to having a piece of art that nags you. There's things you learn from that you can keep around for sure or things you didn't finish, but if it's shit and you finished it, get rid of it. Um, and like I said before, introspective, I think, is just how artists work. I mean, there's there's always that art is an isolating discipline. It requires a lot of solitude and a lot of time spent by yourself deconstructing things as you create them. Um, like the pipes. I spend four hours shading one pipe and then look at it and just to see if the lighting's right. And it's really like, all right, if it sucks, get rid of it, paint over it, drive on. And I chase rabbit holes like anybody else. So there are times that I've been caught. The reason I know this is because I am so guilty of it. It's just diving too deep on subjects, getting involved in it, spending too many hours. And then the next thing that you know, it's a piece of shit. And as they say, you can't polish a turd. So if it's that bad, spend some time taking some of that emotion out on it, I say. But that's just me. Awesome. So here's a question from Lauren. I'm curious about your color, use of color. I noticed that all the pipes were black and white. Any significance? It's the conduits from reality to imagination metaphorically. And I like the colors. I like grays. I heard a story once that Da Vinci could do a hunting mean, black and white when it came to painting. And not to be fat headed about it, but game on. I mean, I want to try and do that. I want to try and excel in art. Um, I wrestled at the college level, played football been in the military, and I'll tell you something now, I've never seen anything as competitive as the world of art, and it's in a great way. 
um, there's a lot of people out there that are artists and there are a lot of people trying to express themselves. And I love that we give voice to all of that, but I'm competitive by nature. So when I heard that he could do that many shades in black and white, I said, game on. And so I enjoy that contrast. It's the best contrast you can get. And I like the way it makes things pop. And that's also a lot of the graffiti influence too. Um, if we notice the colors I do use are not normal colors, it's like turquoise antique blue or primary, like the only ones that are common are the additive primary colors. And I actually had to get off brands to make those match. And so, yeah, like there's a lot of density between black and white. And so I, I like the grays. I like the way it is, but that's could be cool to do uh, an entire piping system in like turquoise blue or red or something that pops and gives it definition and taking it all the way back to a dark red or a dark blue. Um, so, I mean, even now I'm planning for the next show right now because it's just, my brain is geared that way. It's just when I see it, I, so maybe, yeah, a series in different colors of just different designs of pipes or, something of that nature, it's, it's rad idea. Thank you. Okay, here's a question from Sarah. You obviously had to do the show for SMU, but how do you feel about, feel your time at the school affected the show? Slash what part of your education here was the most influential? Um, I don't know, I mean, I guess, I, sculpture was most influential to me because that's where I'm headed next. Uh, not just because of my fascination with going 3D, but because of the way that both Rick and Sherry showed us to approach things and build them as they progress. Like I said, this work wouldn't exist anywhere else like this for me because that process was influential on me. So I would, I would think that sculpture in itself and the way that we were taught to let objects become something, let the clay speak for itself, let the wood speak for itself, let the metal speak for itself, that would be most influential. But that's like asking a fat kid what, fa what his favorite food is too. Um, mine's cake, by the way. And so, yeah, it's, I love all of the classes that I've taken up there. Honestly, it, there wasn't a class that I took nothing from. So a lot of those classes are a close second, but I would have to say that sculpture wins out by a nose because of the methods and the materials and the teachers, uh, sculpture, yeah. Sorry, long way around to get to that answer. I was convincing myself as well. Speaking of teachers, we're gonna have some professor questions coming your way. First one is from go. Chris. Can you talk a little bit about the concept of escapism and the way it's a double-sided thing? Escapism is often framed in a negative way, a childish way to avoid harsh realities. There's an element of that crit in your paintings but I get the sense that you value escapism as a coping mechanism. Where's the line where a good coping mechanism becomes pathological avoidance? In essence, that would be ability. You can't exist in an alternate reality outside of the one that you create. So we have a phrase for that. People are crazy or mentally impaired or um, we label them that way when they're outside of that boundary, when the coping mechanism takes over for the ability to perform daily actions. When you watch too much TV instead of getting the things done that you need to do. When you spend more time drawing than you do talking to the people that you live with or, or the people that you exist around. Uh, I would say that it's a very thin line between escaping and running and artists flirt with that a lot we we see pollock 
uh, other people that have been influenced by alcoholism and the inability to get back to the reality that actually exists and try and live in the one that they created. Some of them go mad. Some of them are functional. Uh, but I, I think that ability and functionality is that layer between coping and running. And when you start to run, that's, that's a bad thing. When you use it to cope, and you understand where the emotion is coming from, motion goes into. I think that is a natural cathartic transition. However, yeah, if it stops you from being able to function normally within the world you've created, then yeah, that escapism is not a good thing, but it is a double-edged sword. We see people that schizophrenics that exist in multiple worlds. We see people with uh, clinical depression that can't escape the grips of that crap. And it's so horrible because it is, that medical condition is so misunderstood and so misdiagnosed. So, I mean, where does ability stop with escapism? Uh, I'd have to say it's judged individually for each person, but their ability to perform their daily tasks their understanding and then beyond that you have to try and live a healthy existence within that reality it's forward from there but once you stop having that ability i think that's that line where escapism becomes a hindrance and not something that we use to uh block out other th and that's a lot of why there is in certain paintings very dense piping. That is my thought process. There is too much. There is hectic. There's no flow. There's no true path. There's no ending where it's a closed system. And I think that's where I fight that line as a natural escapist. Great. We've got a question from Sherry. First, there was a lot of love from Sherry. Great job. Um, and then the question is, has the current COVID-19 crisis or influenced your work? Did it influence your studio practice? Well, considering we're talking on a screen, absolutely. Um, I, I did a lot of big paintings and I did them to invoke a feeling, whether it was passive or aggressive. And so digitally, I lose a lot of that feeling of seeing them in person and texture. So in influencing me, there was the need to have clearer images. There was the need to change to a digital format and try and help the viewer go into the paintings the way that I hope that their eye does if they see them in person. So COVID has made it so I have to pay a bit more detailed attention to what I have and what I'm doing and how I can. I feel like I need to help a little bit in delivering my work. Um, but it's a struggle because the shift is I can be a bit less explaining or less thorough when I explain things, I feel, because they have a personal presence when you're around the paintings. Um, and so I feel like I kind of have to make up for that, I guess. So if I went a little overboard, <laughs> that's my bad. But yeah, it's uh, I, I feel a need to help with the delivery of the art. I really do. Uh, and that's kind of the way that I designed the presentation and the animations. Um, and hopefully it was a bit entertaining as well. But uh, COVID at this point, is, it's just changed our medium to digital. And we need to figure out how to use that tool to deliver it well. Awesome. So this is my last question I have on deck. So this is a kind of a last call if anyone wants to type in a last question. This is from Aaron. I know you do a lot of laser cutting printing on two different materials.
do you see these types of paintings and do you use these types of paintings and translate them into that medium? Absolutely. Um, what I do is I do uh, wood block prints with high grain wood so that when I go in there, it takes chunks out that I don't expect. So it injects a bit of randomness and I convert my files into uh, a digital AI file in Adobe Illustrator. Uh, I make it a line drawing and then I develop it from there for the laser printer so that when I put it in the laser printer, it has a depth and then I roll ink on it like any wood block. Uh, I print with it on Mary's press upstairs or the, the printing press upstairs, not Mary's print, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so I, I do wood blocks. Uh, we've actually done stencils. We've done um, a lot of things that I've used in my work. Uh, but I really look forward to doing more when it comes to creating a depth, maybe making armatures or something with uh, the laser printer and being able to adhere those to the canvases so that things start to develop uh, in the third dimension. Awesome. We haven't had any other questions pop up, so I think we'll probably wrap it here. I'm not going to turn on my video. I'm just going to be a faceless voice for a second because I don't want us to crash out our video at the last minute here. And so, James, with that, everyone, on behalf of myself, all of our viewers, the department, we want to say congratulations to you because what you've just accomplished is amazing and huge. And believe me, everyone has been loving it. It's been a complete joy to get to hear you talk about this work. And all of us can't wait to see this all in person. I'm pretty sure that my little bit in the beginning snapped out. So what I want to say to our listeners and our viewers is that we have Muriel's show next Thursday. And as James kind of mentioned, and we've alluded to, there's going to be an exhibition in person of your guys' work in the fall. So we can all see these paintings in person. So stay tuned for that. And um, with that, I think we can just say congrats again. I hope you feel like you have accomplished something, even though it's in this very strange digital world. And if there's anything else you'd like to say, go for it. Uh, just thank you to everybody again. It really has been a great experience and uh, I look forward to commencement and showing again in the fall and I hope that uh, I really do get the opportunity to keep making this work regardless of where and who it's with, but it's been a great experience here at SNU. Thanks again to all the professors, my family, Megan Ollie, and everybody have a good night. Be safe. Watch your hands. Great. Thanks, James. And thank you all for tuning in. We're looking forward to seeing you again next Thursday at 530. Until then, stay safe and wash your hands. Absolutely.